comprehension. In this section of the test, you will have an opportunity to demonstrate your ability to understand conversations and talks in English. There are three parts to this section, with special directions for each part. Answer all the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied by the speakers in this test. Do not take notes or write in your test book at any time. Do not turn the pages until you are told to do so. Part A. Directions. In Part A, you will hear short conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will hear a question about the conversation. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to... Here is an example. On the recording, you hear... I don't like this painting very much. Neither do I. What does the man mean? In your test book, you read... A. He doesn't like the painting either. B. He doesn't know how to paint. C. He doesn't have any paintings. D. He doesn't know what to do. You learn from the conversation that neither the man nor the woman likes the painting. The best answer to the question, what does the man mean, is A. He doesn't like the painting either. Therefore, the correct choice is A. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin part A with the number one. Do you have this style shirt in my size? I'll check, but to tell you the truth, I think this one is right for you. What does the woman mean? Number two. Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized that I forgot to bring the tape recorder you lent me. I left it back at my dorm. That's all right. I won't need it until tonight, as long as I've got it by then. What does the woman imply about the tape recorder? Number three. So, how much was your plane ticket? More than I could really afford. I had to dip into my savings. What does the woman imply? What does the woman imply? Number four. Wednesdays are going to be busy days for me next semester. Three classes in the morning and then two more in the afternoon. I won't even have time for lunch. You really should try to fit it in, you know. Those afternoon classes will be tough to sit through if your stomach's rumbling. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number five. You're dropping out of the marching band? But I thought you loved it. All the traveling, playing before big crowds. I do, but with all that time away from my studies, my grades are really starting to slip. What does really starting to slip? What does the man mean? Number six. I'm thinking of getting a new pants suit to wear to Jane's wedding. Well, I just hope that my old suit still fits. You know how I feel about shopping. What does the man imply? Number seven. What's my share of the bill? Eighteen fifty. That can't be right. I only had a salad for dinner. Don't get excited. Let me check the math. What will the woman probably do next?
number eight. I'm surprised that Sarah told her boss he was wrong to have fired his secretary. I know, but that's Sarah. If she has an opinion, everyone's got to know it. What does the woman mean? Number nine. How about a movie tonight? That new comedy is opening in town. Sounds great, but I've got to put the finishing touches on my psychology research paper. What does the woman imply? Number ten. You won't have to look very hard to find a job on campus, but I don't think you'll find anything that isn't just part time. That suits me. Anything more than that, and I'd have to change my class schedule. More than that, and I'd have to change my class schedule. What does the man mean? Number eleven. Do you think you'll feel energetic enough to walk to our study group session tonight? If there is one, I guess you haven't heard the weather report. Over a foot of snow is expected. What does the woman imply? Number twelve. Oh, I turned all of my white socks pink. I threw a red T-shirt in by accident. Have you tried running them through again with bleach? What does the woman suggest the man do? Number thirteen. I hear that your brother's planning to transfer to another university. Not if I can talk him out of it, and believe me, I'm trying. What does the man imply? Number 14. I'd like to enroll in the free seminar you advertised in the newspaper, the one on managing your personal finances. Okay. Now the ad did say that you have to have a savings account at our bank to be eligible. Do you have one here? What does the man want to know? Number 15. Weather forecast for this weekend? I can't believe how the temperature is going to dip. I know. That isn't my idea of what October should be like. What does the man mean? Number 16. This exhibit is a total bore. I can't believe they call this art. I think I've seen enough. What will the woman probably do next? Number seventeen. We should probably think about selecting someone to lead our study group. You know, somebody really organized. Then you can count me out. What does the man mean? Number 18. What do you think would be a reasonable price to pay for a new computer? You're asking the wrong person. My brother gave me mine. What does the man imply? Number 19. That's a nice-looking jacket. It fits you perfectly. Is it something you bought recently? Thanks. No, I've had it a while. I've just been waiting for the weather to cool down. What does the man imply? Number twenty. 
What's wrong with Harold today? He's what's wrong with Harold today? He snapped at me for no reason. Don't worry. It's just the end of semester pressure. He'll be his old self next week. What does the woman say about Harold? Go on to the next page. Number 21. I'm sorry, I need to work late tonight, so you should probably cancel our reservation at the restaurant. Oh, actually, I never got around to making one in the first place. What does the man mean? Professor Johnson, for my sociology project this term, I'm thinking of interviewing all the residents in town on their TV viewing habits. Well, that's quite an undertaking for such a short-term project. Maybe you should take a little while to think about what that would entail before making your final decision. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 23. How do I look in this new sweater I bought yesterday? I was in a hurry, so I didn't have a chance to try it on. Well, I really like the style, but it looks a little tight. You might want to take it back and get the next size up. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 24. Do you have any idea what it'll cost to send this little package to Australia? You got me. The farthest I've ever sent a package is Canada. What does the woman mean? Number 25. This isn't the dish I ordered, but I'm glad I got it. It's delicious. As far as I'm concerned, the waiter should still hear about it. Questions 36 through 39. Listen to part of a discussion in a geology class. Let's say you're a geologist, and you let's say you're a geologist, and you want to investigate the geological history of the place. That is, how did geologists determine things like, say, how were the rocks formed? Or was an area once underwater? If so, when? How should you go about it? I start with stratigraphy. Could you explain what that is for the class? Well, stratigraphy is the description of strata in sedimentary rock. I guess that's not so clear, huh? Okay, let's say you want to investigate a spot near a river, for example. Well, over the history of that area, every time the river flooded, it would deposit a layer of sediment all through its floodplain. Sometimes a bigger layer, sometimes smaller, depending on the size of the flood. Well, one layer, or stratum, gets deposited over another. Obviously, these strata build up over millions of years, Stratigraphy is the study of these layers of deposited sediment. So does that mean that I can tell how long ago each one was deposited? Not necessarily. You see, there might have been some years when the river didn't flood and no sediment was deposited. You need other kinds of evidence to tell how much time might have gone by between when one layer got deposited and the one on top of it got deposited. And what are those other kinds of evidence you're talking about? Well, fossils, for one. You can determine exactly how old a fossil is, and that's how you can tell how old the rock surrounding it is. Very good. The discovery of that particular technique is an interesting story. It was a man named William Smith who first used fossils for the purpose of dating strata back in the 1800s. Let's take a look at how he went about making this geological breakthrough. Number 36. What is the discussion mainly about? Uh, 
seven. What does the woman explain when she talks about rivers? According to the discussion, why are geologists unable to determine the geological age of an area by studying sediment deposits alone? Number 39. What will the class probably discuss next? Part the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part C are being read. Part C. Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear several short talks. After each talk, you will hear some questions. The talk and the questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Here is an example. On the recording, you hear, listen to an instructor talk to his class about a television program. I'd like to tell you about an interesting TV program that will be shown this coming Thursday. It'll be on from 9 to 10 p.m. on Channel 4. It's part of a series called Mysteries of Human Biology. The subject of the program is the human brain, how it functions and how it can malfunction. Topics that will be covered are dreams, memory, and depression. These topics are illustrated with outstanding computer animation that makes the explanations easy to follow. Make an effort to see this show. Since we've been studying the nervous system in class, I know you'll find it very helpful. Now listen to a sample question. What is the main purpose of the program? In your test book, you read A, to demonstrate the latest use of computer graphics. B, to discuss the possibility of an economic depression. C, to explain the workings of the brain. D, to dramatize a famous mystery story. The best answer to the question, what is the main purpose of the program, is C, to explain the workings of the brain. Therefore, the correct choice is C. Now listen to another sample question. Why does the speaker recommend watching the program? In your test book, you read A, it is required of all science majors. B, it will never be shown again. C. It can help viewers improve their memory skills. D. It will help with coursework. The best answer to the question, why does the speaker recommend watching the program, is D. It will help with coursework. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin part C with the first talk. Questions 40 through 43. Listen to part of a talk in a cultural anthropology class. Recently, some anthropologists conducted an interesting case study in ethnology. Now, ethnology, as you recall, is a branch of anthropology that deals with how various cultures develop and change. The study was about the development of basket weaving by African-American women who live in the town of Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. The town is known for its high-quality sweetgrass baskets, which are woven by these women. They've been weaving the baskets for generations, handing down the skill from mother to daughter. Some of the baskets have been placed on permanent display at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The origin of their basket weaving dates back to the 17th century, and even earlier. 
when these women's ancestors came to the United States from the west coast of Africa. Now, it's mainly a hobby, but back in the 17th and 18th century, African-American women wove the baskets for use on the rice plantations. There were two types of baskets then, work baskets and baskets for use in the home. The work baskets were made out of bulrushes. Bulrush is a long, tough grass that grows in marshes. One type of work basket was the fan basket, which was used to separate grains of rice from the waste. The baskets used in the homes were made out of the more delicate sweet grass. They were used for everything from fruit baskets to baby cradles. Number 40. What is the talk mainly about? Number 41. How did the women mentioned in the learn to weave baskets? According to the speaker, what type of baskets were made out of bulrush? Number 43. What is the main reason that the women in South Carolina now weave baskets? Listen to a talk in a biology class. This morning, I want to tell you about a recent scientific discovery dealing with the relationship between most. This is about a desert shrub whose leaves can shoot a stream of poisonous resin a distance of six feet. You think it would be safe from all attacks by insects, but a recent study has found one insect, a beetle, that can chew its way past the plant's defense system by cutting the main vein that delivers the poison to the leaves. This vein cutting is just one method the beetles use to prepare a safe meal. Another is by cutting a path all the way across the leaf to halt the flow of chemicals. Then they simply eat between the veins of poison. In the past, scientists who studied insect adaptations to plant defenses have focused on chemical responses that is, how the insects can neutralize or alter the poisonous substances plants produce. What's unique about this chewing strategy is that the beetle is actually exhibiting a behavioral response to the plant's defenses, rather than the common chemical response. It is only after a beetle survives several encounters with a plant's resin that it learns how to avoid the poison by chewing through the resin transporting veins on the next leaf it eats and thus gets itself a safe meal. However, it can take a beetle an hour and a half of careful vein cutting to prepare a small leaf that takes it only a few minutes to eat. So, though the method is effective, it's not very efficient. Number 44. What is the talk mainly about? What is unusual about the desert plant? Number 46. How can the beetles avoid being poisoned by the plant? through 50. Listen to part of the talk in a literature class. The professor is discussing the poetry of ancient Greece. We're going to start our discussion of poetry in Western Europe with the Iliad and the Odyssey. These two Greek poems stand out as great examples of the earliest European poems. They're believed to have been written sometime between 800 BC and 700 BC, partly because the poems refer to the social conditions of that time conditions that have been validated by the findings of archaeologists. 
but just who was the poet who laid down these cornerstones of Western literature? Homer. But we know virtually nothing about this Homer. In fact, some say that such a poet never existed at all, that neither the Iliad nor the Odyssey was written by a single poet. But rather, each poem is a composite of the writings of several people. This, anyway, was the view of a school of literary critics in the 18th century known as the Analysts. The Analysts pointed to internal evidence, such as variations in the literary devices used in the poems, to argue that each work was, in fact, a collection of several poems by several Greek authors. Opposing the Analysts were a second group of scholars called the Unitarians. They insisted that the Iliad and the Odyssey could well have been the work of a single poetic genius. To support their argument, they stressed, among other things, the consistency of the characters portrayed in the stories. This wouldn't have been possible, they said, if they were written by many different poets. Wouldn't have been possible, they said, if they were written by many different poets. Now, how we look at the Homeric question today has been greatly influenced by someone named Milman Perry an American scholar who first presented his ideas about Homer in the 1930s. So let's take a look at Perry's research and how it affects what modern-day scholars think about Homer. Number 47. What aspect of the Iliad and the Odyssey does the professor mainly discuss? According to the professor, what is one of the claims made by the analyst? What is one type of evidence that a single poet could have written both the Iliad and the Odyssey? 